I'm always thankful to have the opportunity to come before God and his people with the seriousness of preaching the word. And as we are together to come and to hear what thus saith the Lord, I hope, pray, and trust that our hearts are honest and good and ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Amen. Tonight we're going to be talking about the fear of the Lord. I remember when I first came across this phraseology and I became very interested in it and how often it was used and referred to in the scriptures and I was awed by it. And then I recognized so many connections that was made with this phraseology, the fear of the Lord. It's laced from the patriarchal system through the mosaic system and into the glorious Christian dispensation as well that we see the fear of the Lord and it doesn't change. When I was considering the fear of the Lord, I thought about what it meant and the multiple definitions that are found uh, in the Hebrew language and also in the Greek. When we consider the fear of the Lord, it means to be afraid, to stand in awe, reverence, respect, honor. Furthermore, it means to be fearful, to be dreadful, to make afraid, to terrify, to be held in awe. When we consider just those quick definitions from the Hebrew and the Greek, I often would ask myself, how much do I tremble at God? How much do I tremble at his word? How much do I honor and respect and glorify him? The more I thought about that, I thought about us as a people, as the people of God, and the responsibility we have in fearing God. When I consider the fear of the Lord, there are a few passages that come to mind that I want us to uh, be thinking about as a foundation. In Psalm 111 and verse number 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When we consider wisdom, we're talking about skillful living. When I consider a child of God, whether it is under the patriarchal system, the mosaic system, or the Christian dispensation, God has always wanted his people to live skillfully. To be able to live their lives in a way that is not accidental, but it is purposeful. In Proverbs 1 and verse number 7, a passage that all of us know very well, that the beginning of knowledge is the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and then there's more part, more to it. But the word knowledge there is very interesting. It literally means recognition or instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of recognition. To be able to recognize who God is and what he has taught and what he is teaching. When you consider this particular phraseology, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and a fountain of life. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27. Look at Proverbs 8 and verse number 13. I think this is worthy of us reading together. For here we see that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. You put some of these things together that we have just been talking about already, and we see that the fear of the Lord is all about skillful living, recognizing who God is and his instruction, being a fountain of life and strong confidence, and hating those things that God hates. That's the fear of the Lord, but that's just a little bit. I tell you, the more I study this phraseology and this concept uh, all through the scriptures, God is trying to teach his people something. God is trying to teach his people that I am separated from you. What do we mean by that? I am holy. And God is a holy God. And because God is holy, God wants us to take his word, take his will, take his way, and rise to the occasion in which we can. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. We stop and we consider these things. What does it mean to, be, to walk in the fear of the Lord? It's walking in his way. It's loving him and serving him with our entire being. Jesus would say it like this in Matthew 22, verses 37 through verse number 39. 
When we consider our responsibility of loving God and loving our neighbor, friends, that's our responsibility. We consider these particular words, friends, and God wants us to be a people who fear him. Look at Proverbs 28 and verse 14. And when I came across this passage, it was very interesting because it put a smile on my face as it ought to put a smile on every last one of our faces if we are faithful to God. And the very fact that you're here, I would say that you are. In Proverbs 28 and verse number 14, the King James Version has something, uh, has a very powerful translation. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Happy is the man that always, who is always reverent. Uh, the King James would say, happy is the man who feareth always. Hmm, that's interesting. The fear of the Lord ought to make the child of God happy. Amen. The instructions of the Lord ought to make us happy. To shun evil and pride and arrogance ought to make us happy. The instructions and knowledge and recognition of the Lord ought to make the child of God happy. Which means that there's no reason for the child of God to be walking around sad for a long period of time. Why? Because we're walking in the fear of the Lord. We consider these words and I thought about what Paul told Timothy. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15 that from a child he has known the holy scriptures which to make him wise. The idea of being wise is skillful, intelligent, devising cleverly. And so when we consider the fear of the Lord and what it is, friends, this is just a little background of what the fear of the Lord is. Number two, we have great examples of those who feared God. Real quick, we consider Joseph. You remember Joseph, the one that, in whom the Bible says that God was with him. In Genesis 42 and verse number 18, Joseph said with his own mouth to his own brethren, I fear God. I reverence him. I honor him. I revere him. I tremble at his feet. Sometimes I wonder if even the people of God tremble at the feet of God. Job 1 in verse number 8, from the very mouth of God himself, he's talking about Job, and he says something very powerful. He says he's blameless, he's upright, he fears God, and he shuns evil. Friend, it is not enough to just tremble at God. One has to tremble at God and shun evil. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 17 and 21, something is said about those Hebrew midwives. You remember what was said about them when the Hebrew uh, women were given birth on the birth stool? The Hebrew midwives, because they feared God rather than the king, they would save the boy children. No wonder when we consider these great points here, friends, God is teaching us something. That we would rather obey God than man. We would rather fear God than man. Look at Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 2. Let me show you a little quick point here. There you'll come across a man by the name of Hananiah. And the Bible teaches us that Hananiah feared God. He was one that was faithful. When we consider these particular words and ideas, it was Nehemiah who was in Persia who would go to King Artaxerxes on the name and the words of Hananiah, and he would go all the way to Jerusalem to build the wall to secure Jerusalem based upon a man that feared God. Which also teaches us that when we fear God, people ought to trust us enough to know that that man fears God, and I'm going to take him at his word because he has demonstrated the fear of the Lord in his life. Amen. Which also teaches us that the fear of the Lord can be recognized. In Acts chapter 10 and verse number 2, Cornelius feared God with all his house. Every single occasion when we consider the practice of the fear of the Lord, it has benefited either the individual or the group, which also teaches us when we consider Joseph as we brought him up earlier, he feared God. And the very fact that he feared God, the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 45 verses 5 and 8 that God worked through Joseph to preserve life and to bring forth posterity for his people. Yeah. All because he feared God. 
We consider something else as it relates to Job. Job, when he feared God, it benefited not only he, but it benefited his future family, Job 42. And James would bring this particular out, that the end of Job's life was better than the beginning. Amen. Oh, friends, it, it pays to fear the Lord. When we consider the fear of the Lord, we see Job, his integrity was maintained, spiritual benefits. God blessed the end of his life with possessions, physical benefits. Oh, I think we said something, that God, he blesses those who fear him spiritually and physically. No wonder Jesus would say it like this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24 through 34, he says, I can't take care of the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, surely I'll take care of you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be what? Added. How often, Brother McCann, we find people searching and reaching after the physical, and then when they get around to it, the spiritual. Friends, if anything, we are addressing and seeking after the spiritual, and we'll let God take care of the physical. But then when we consider the Hebrew midwives, they feared uh, God and Moses benefited from it and Israel benefited from it by being delivered from Egyptian bondage. What am I saying? I'm saying, friends, that if we would just have enough courage to fear the Lord the way that God has designed for us to fear him, he'll take care of everything that we need. Amen. Number three, the fear of the Lord must be heard and learned. Friends, did you get that? You're not going to accidentally fear God. You have to be taught how to fear the Lord. We stop and we consider these particular things, and it made me think about Psalm 34 and verse number 11. Turn there. In Psalm 34 and verse number 11, the psalmist would say this, Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which means, Brother Payton, that as a father, i got to teach my child the fear of the Lord. They come into this world knowing absolutely nothing. You remember what was said in uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse number 11? As it relates to infants, as they are in the womb, they don't know good nor evil. Adolescents, right out of the womb, up to about three years old, Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse number 39, they don't know good nor evil. When we consider uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 through 16, in the prophecy of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus had to learn to refuse the evil and choose the good. Friends, we have to be teaching. And no wonder when we consider these great points here, God wants us to teach the fear of the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, when we consider... Those under the Mosaic period, they're about to go into the promised land, the second generation of the children of Israel. We see something very powerful and worthy of our consideration. Now, this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may what? Fear the Lord your God. And notice what is associated, connected to fearing God. To keep all, not some, not 99.9%, .9 all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you and your sons and your grandsons all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. It is something about fearing God and keeping his commandments. And when I fear God and keep his commandments, you don't have to worry about me being faithful because faithfulness is going to come because I'm fearing God. I'm reverencing him. I'm afraid of him. You know, you listen to some liberals, you think that no one should be afraid of God. But every time I look at God's track record, which is the word of God, I see that he don't play. I used to tell my children when they was kids, I ain't playing with you. Try that again if you want to. Try me. I remember one time I was 15 years old. I used to take my dad's car. He had a 1971 Buick Electra. That was a big old boat. Take that thing around the corner, man, drive it. One day, this was a different day. Man, lady ran in front of me and I, and I said, uh-oh. The next thing you know, they had to call my dad. My dad, you know, back in the day, if you had to call your dad off of work, you was in trouble. 
Now my dad, he's about as black as I am. And when he got out that truck, he looked like the Incredible Hulk Green. And let me tell you, and I'm being serious. He said, boy, if I whoop you right now, I'll kill you. And I said, Dad, you don't got to worry about whooping me. Whatever you want to do to me after that, that'll be okay. He didn't whoop me, and I was praising God for that. You know what? I was scared of my daddy. But I respected him because he was right. And I look back, and those were some of the best days because he taught me a lesson. Son, just do what I ask, and you don't have to worry about none of these problems. Yes, sir. It's the same thing with Jehovah God. We do what he asks, and we don't have to worry about anything. And so that ought to be a good lesson for some of us as fathers and mothers, rearing children and grandchildren. You've got to put the fear of God in their hearts. And when you do that, then you can let up a little bit and let them live. Y'all get that when you get home. We got too many children running the house today. Oh, that ain't part of my lesson. <laughs> that's, that's not even part of my lesson. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 10, let me prove this. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12, God requires the fear of the Lord. And I found it very interesting when you consider what God says right here. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? So I looked that word require up as I was studying, and that word require literally means ask of you. That's interesting. That, well, we wouldn't look at the word require like that. If something is required, well, then uh, God is not asking. He's telling you. But here he said he's asking this of you. Well, that's fair. It's fair for God to ask certain things of us. And in him asking, it's a command. It's a command. Which means that God doesn't have to be mean and ugly to us in order to command us. So in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse number 19, God even taught his people how to fear him. It's not enough to just fear God. You've got to know how to fear God. And so when you consider the word taught, matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 19. It's interesting that when we consider the fear of the Lord, all of us should be fearing God. And it shall be with him, verse number 19, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. He must learn. The idea of learn there means to be trained, to be provoked to action. Hmm. Same idea in Acts chapter 9 and verse number 5. Remember when Saul was kicking against the goads? Here he was kicking against the instructions of Jesus Christ. And friends, when we consider the instructions that God has given us, it is for our benefit. And so, it reminds me of 1 John 5 and verse number 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. God wants us to provoke one another unto love and good works. Hebrews 10 and verse number 24. When we do this, it's going to cause us and encourage us and develop us and motivate us to be genuine people for him. Friends, did you get that point? Did you hear that? If anything, we want to be genuine when we approach God. I'm going something somewhere with this. You remember in Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 14. Turn your Bibles there and you remember... Joshua is at the end of his life, and he is commissioning his people, giving them a charge. And as he's giving them a charge, he's letting them know that they need to make a decision. And here in Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 14, notice what he says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods of your fathers, that your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt served the Lord. Now, let's look at a few things. Here we find Joshua, and he's telling the people of God that you need to be sincere and you need to be truthful when you deal with God. Now, this is divine commentary as it relates to the attitude and as it relates to the standard of John 4, verse number 24. 
You remember what that says? God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. That's a genuine attitude. And in truth, that's the standard. Nothing has changed. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I believe it's verse number 8. Yes, verse number 8. In the context of church discipline, Sean Payton, in the context of church discipline, look at what the Bible there says. This is very powerful. God has always wanted his people to be genuine. He has always wanted his people to be truthful and go according to the standard. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, three places we see, we see during the time of Joshua as it relates to their genuine lifestyle. We see also as it relates to approaching God in worship. And we see as it relates to New Testament behavior in the church. God has always wanted his people to be sincere and live their lives based upon truth. Amen. You, friends, you, it's no way that you can be dishonest and not go according to the standard of God's word and come before God and say, I fear the Lord. There's no way. There's no way. And so God sets the record straight by saying, be holy, even as I am holy. Number five, who? Who is to fear God? I want you to consider some of these things that are powerful. And the Bible just lines it out one by one. Who is to fear God? Psalm 33 and verse number 18, all men are to fear God. Hmm. Did Jesus die for some men or all men? Did Jesus die for this group or that group? Jesus died for all men. And therefore, all men must fear God. And for this reason, the fear of the Lord can be refused or rejected. Proverbs 1 verse 29. Men can totally be absent of the fear of the Lord. And so then that made me ask a question. Turn to Psalm 36 verse number 1. And let's see if we can learn something here. In Psalm 36 and verse number 1, the psalmist sets the record straight as it relates to why do men sin? Hmm. We've already talked about the fear of the Lord and what the benefits of the fear of the Lord is. And when someone is walking in the fear of the Lord, they don't have to worry about sinning against God. But the problem is, is when they're not walking in the fear of the Lord. The problem is, is when they're walking according to their own understanding. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walk to direct his steps. And so with this, this being said, notice what the psalmist says as he's musing, as he is pondering and thinking about mankind. He says, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Why do men sin? Why do men do what they want to do today? Why do men teach false doctrine today? Why do men hold the false doctrine today? It's because they don't fear God. I knew when my dad got out of that truck, I was done. <laughs> Guess what? Shouldn't a person know that when they're sinning against God and they live in that state, that they're putting their soul in jeopardy? Amen. When you got men teaching and preaching false doctrines, Shouldn't they know that they're putting their souls in jeopardy and the souls of others? When I don't preach sound doctrine, Titus 2 and verse number 1, Brother Carl, I'm putting the congregation in jeopardy. Amen. And when the fear of the Lord is not before the people, that means I don't know what else is before the people, but it ain't, it ain't the fear of the Lord. And when we stop and we consider these things, friends, God wants us to fear him, but it begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. So why do men sin? Because there's no fear of God before their eyes. There may be one that might say, well, I just don't believe that. That's Bible. And the reason why we know this is true, because when a person don't reverence God, when a person is not respectful toward God, if they don't honor God, if God doesn't have the final say in their life, if God is not directing their steps with the word of God, then friends, you're guiding your own steps. Amen. And God says, I don't want that. 
And so every household, every husband ought to be walking according to the fear of the Lord. Well, what's the fear of the Lord? Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church. Every wife ought to be walking in the fear of the Lord. Well, what is that? Uh, wives, be submissive to your own husbands in everything. <laughs> one brother one brother was preaching the gospel meeting one time and got to that verse in Ephesians chapter 5 and got to the word in everything and he everything he started whispering he said brother don't get quiet on me when I need you <laughs> sometimes the, sometimes the sisters are running the house that's not even part of my lesson Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Listen to your parents. That's the fear of the Lord. I was talking to someone just the other day, and the, the child wasn't listening and saying, you're tripping. I don't know why you're acting like that. That would have never went on in my house. I, I could just see myself getting off the floor. I remember one time, and I'm not trying to be funny, but my dad was sitting there cooking eggs one time, and my sister mouthed out. He went like that, and he was still cooking eggs. <laughs> Now, I just, now, here's the point. My dad took care of that real quick. <laughs> Sometimes we're allowing our children to get away with things, and what we're doing is we're setting them up for not being fearful to God. Because one thing that God is not, except chapter 10 and verse number 34, he's no respect of persons. And so, with that being said, friends, we have to teach our children the fear of the Lord. Preachers must be preaching the fear of the Lord. Elders must make sure that the fear of the Lord is always being promulgated from the pulpit. If not, why not? But then there's benefits to the fear of the Lord. Turn to the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, this is a very powerful passage. There are benefits to fearing God. And God actually sees when his people are fearing him, reverencing him, being moral before his sight, using the right terminology and language as they are discussing things with their wives and husbands and brethren. And notice what is said here. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They fellowshiped with one another. They conversed with one another. They declared God's word to one another. And guess who was paying attention? The Lord. It's something when good brethren are talking about God's word and they're looking at scripture and they're rightly dividing it. But there's another thing when you're trying to fellowship with those you shouldn't be fellowshipping with. God ain't hearing that. We have to be careful. And so, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditated on his name. Question, how often are you meditating? How often are you demonstrating to God that you fear him, you reverence him? that you tremble before him. Friends, this is something that we have to keep in the forefront, forefront of our mind. Look at Psalm 112. In Psalm 112, we see similar language. Psalm 112 in verse number one, notice what the Bible says. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Now notice what's connected to it who delights greatly in his commandments. When a man doesn't delight in the commandments of God, saying that it's about rules and not, re it's about relationship and not rules, you got a problem. Yeah. Friends, when we stop and we consider, what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is to keep the word of God. When you consider Psalm 128, look at verse number one and verse four. We see the same language. It's all over the scriptures, brethren. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. What does it mean to walk in his way? I believe in 1 John 1 and verse number 7, as it relates to walking in the light as he is in the light. How do I walk in the light? Well, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. So how do I know that I'm fearing the Lord? I'm staying with the light. 
I'm staying with God. I'm reverencing him. I'm honoring him. Turn to Proverbs 13 as we come to some type of closure. Because I need you to make an application in your own life. Because when you do this, then you'll be able to exercise the fear of the Lord in a proper manner. In Proverbs 13 and verse number 13, notice what the Bible there says. He who despises the word will be destroyed. But he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. There is something about doing what God wants you to do. Look at chapter 14. Look at verse 2. He who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. But he who is perverse in his ways despises him. There is so much confusion, which I really don't understand why it is so confusing today. That when you got people who are walking in darkness and you got people who seemingly are walking in light saying that the ones that are walking in darkness are actually walking in the light, then you're calling good evil and good and evil good. And that's wrong. And so there ought to be a clear distinction between that which is holy and that which is unholy, that which is light and that which is dark. And friends, God makes a clear distinction. It is us sometimes that don't. In verse number 16, Proverbs 14, 16, a wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. In Proverbs 28, verse 14, we looked at this before, but I want to say it right here again. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart falls into calamity. And so, we'll end with this. Look at Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we see something about Cornelius. And we see something powerful said from Peter's mouth. He says, God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't show partiality. But in every nation, listen to this, friends, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by God. What does it mean to fear God? Let me tell you what it means. It means that you keep his commandments. And friends, as Christians, we do keep the rules of God. To not keep his rules is to be unfaithful. God has put the fear of the Lord in his word. Psalm 138 and verse number 2, God said there that I magnify my word above my name. All we have here is his word. And so therefore we need the word of God and we need to be allowing it to dwell in our hearts richly. I said this yesterday and I'll say it right now. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the spirit. You know what? We ought to be a spirit filled people. How? Colossians 3 and verse number 16, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. And so when we allow God's word to dwell in us richly, Galatians 5 and verse number 16, we are walking according to the spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because I reverence God. I respect God. I honor God. I keep his commandments. I make sure that God is at the forefront of my mind and his word has the final say in my life. Question. How often are you spending, or how are you spending your time? Are you spending your time in God's word as you ought, so you can have the word of God, the fear of the Lord, dwelling in your heart richly? I tell you, I tell you, about three months ago, I got off Facebook. And the reason why is because I got tired of reading about other people's lives instead of the life of Christ. You'll get that when you get home. Sometimes we're more interested in the lives of others than into the life of Christ. We've got to spend time getting to know our Jesus, getting to know the word, getting to know God. And friends, when you do this, I guarantee you the words of God will be just coming out of your mouth. Reminds me of what Jesus told that woman in John chapter 4. It would be a living water springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 7, 37 through 39. It will be flowing. And that's what we want. We want God's word to be flowing out of our mouths, flowing up into everlasting life. And when that takes place, friends, we can't help but do God's will. We'll be a better husband, a better wife, better children, better leaders, better community, 
uh, people in our community, friends, we'll be just better. We'll be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, city that's set up on a hill that cannot be hid. Friend, that's what God wants. And so when we demonstrate the fear of the Lord in our lives, it ought to be someone on the outside that will say, I appreciate you. I may not agree with everything that you say, but you're consistent and you love the Lord and I can tell. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6, 26? Woe unto you if all men speak well of you. It's okay when people don't like you. You know, we need to teach our young people that. I had five, I have five kids and sometimes you used to come home and say, so and so don't like me. So? What you mean, so? They don't have to like you. Are you doing what's right? Yes. You know, we need to tell each other that sometimes. It's okay if people don't like us. You just do what's right. You fear God. You be respectful. You do what God desires for you to do according to the scriptures. And I guarantee you, you're here well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Because if we don't hear that, we lost it all. Maybe you're not a child of God. We want you to be. We want you to consider the gospel message. For the only way that one can come to Christ is through Jesus Christ. It's through the blood of Christ. It's through the gospel of Christ. What will it take? It will take you having an honest and good heart. Luke 8, 15, number 1. It will take the seed, which is the word of God, Luke 8, verse number 11. And the seed, which is the word of God in an honest and good heart, is going to produce nothing but a Christian. That's it. Yeah, that's it's not going to produce a hyphenated Christian. It's just going to produce a Christian. <coughs> and so we'll consider.